Chapter Fifteen of the Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen. Happy Fear gives himself up. I know how tired you are," said Ariel, as he came back into the room. "I shall not keep you long." Ah, please do," he returned quickly, beginning to fumble with the shade of a student lamp at one end of the desk let me do that she said sit down he obeyed at once and watched her as she lit the lamp and stretching upon tiptoe turned out the gas no she continued seated again and looking across the desk at him i wanted to see you at the first possible opportunity but what i have to say wait he interrupted let me tell you why i did not come yesterday you need not tell me i know she glanced at the chair which had been occupied by mrs fear i knew last night that they had sent for you you did he exclaimed ah i understand sam wharton must have told you yes she said it was he and i've been wondering ever since how he heard of it he knew last night but there was nothing in the papers this morning and until i came here i heard no one else speak of it yet canaan is not large joe laughed it wouldn't seem strange if you lived with the canaan that i do sam had been downtown during the afternoon and had met friends the colored people are a good deal like a freemasonry you know a great many knew last night all about what had happened and had their theories about what might happen today in case the two men met still you see those who knew also knew just what people not to tell the tocsin is the only newspaper worth the name here but even if the tocsin had known of the trouble it wouldn't have been likely to mention it that's a thing i don't understand he frowned and rubbed the back of his head there's something underneath it for more than a year the tocsin hasn't spoken of beaver beach i'd like to know why joe she said slowly tell me something truly a man said to me yesterday that he found life here insufferable do you find it so why no he answered surprised do you hate canaan certainly not you don't find it dull provincial unsympathetic he laughed cheerily well there's this he explained i have an advantage over your friend i see a more interesting side of things probably the people i live among are pretty thorough cosmopolites in a way and the life i lead i think i begin to understand a little about the life you lead she interrupted then you don't complain of canaan of course not she threw him a quick bright happy look then glanced again at the chair in which mrs fear had sat joe she said last night i heard the people singing in the houses the old sunday evening way it took me back so yes it would and something else there's one hymn they sing more than any other it's canaan's favorite do you know what it is is it rescue the perishing that's it rescue the perishing he cried and repeated the words again gave forth a peal of laughter so hard that it brought tears to his eyes rescue the perishing at first she did not understand his laughter but after a moment she did and joined her own to it though with a certain tremulousness it is funny isn't it said joe wiping the moisture from his eyes then all trace of mirth left him is it really you sitting here and laughing with me ariel it seems to be she answered in a low voice i'm not at all sure you didn't think yesterday afternoon he began almost in a whisper you didn't think that i had failed to come because i he grew very red and shifted the sentence awkwardly i was afraid you might think that i was that i didn't come because i might have been the same way again that i was when when i met you at the station oh no she answered gently no i knew better and do you know he faltered that that is all over that it can never happen again yes i know it she returned quickly then you know a little of what i owe you no no she protested yes he said you've made that change in me already it wasn't hard it won't be oh it might have been if if you hadn't come soon tell me something she demanded 
if these people had not sent for you yesterday would you have come to judge pike's house to see me you said you would try she laughed a little and looked away from him i want to know if you would have come there was a silence and in spite of her averted glance she knew that he was looking at her steadily finally don't you know he said she shook her head and blushed faintly don't you know he repeated she looked up and met his eyes and thereupon both became very grave yes i do she answered you would have come when you left me at the gate and went away you were afraid but you would have come yes i'd have come you are right i was afraid at first but i knew he went on rapidly that you would have come to the gate to meet me you understood that she cried her eyes sparkling and her face flushing happily yes i knew that you wouldn't have asked me to come he said with a catch in his voice which was half chuckle half groan if you hadn't meant to take care of me and it came to me that you would know how to do it she leaned back in her chair and again they laughed together but only for a moment becoming serious and very quiet almost instantly i haven't thanked you for the roses he said oh yes you did when you first looked at them so i did he whispered i'm glad you saw to find them here took my breath away and to find you with them i brought them this morning you know would you have come if you had not understood why i failed yesterday oh yes i think so she returned the fine edge of a smile upon her lips for a time last evening before i heard what had happened i thought you were too frightened a friend to bother about he made a little ejaculation partly joyful partly sad and yet she went on i think that i should have come this morning after all even if you had a poorer excuse for your absence because you see i came on business you did that's why i've come again that makes it respectable for me to be here now doesn't it for me to have come out alone after dark without their knowing it i'm here as your client joe why he asked she did not answer at once but picked up a pen from beneath her hand on the desk and turning it meditatively felt its point with her forefinger before she said slowly are most men careful of other people's well of other people's money you mean martin pike he asked yes i want you to take charge of everything i have for me he bent a frowning regard upon the lampshade you ought to look after your own property he said you surely have plenty of time you mean you mean you won't help me she returned with intentional pathos ariel he laughed shortly in answer then asked what makes you think judge pike isn't trustworthy nothing very definite perhaps unless it was his look when i told him that i meant to ask you to take charge of things for me he's been rather hard pressed this year i think said joe you might be right if he could have found a way i hope he hasn't i'm afraid she began gaily that i know very little of my own affairs he sent me a draft every three months with receipts and other things to sign and return to him i haven't the faintest notion of what i owe except the old house and some money from the income that i hadn't used and brought with me judge pike has all the papers everything joe looked troubled and roger tabor did he the dear man she shook her head he was just the same to him poor uncle jonas's money seemed to have come from heaven through the hands of judge pike and there's a handsome roundabout way said joe wasn't it she agreed cheerfully and he trusted the judge absolutely i don't you see he gave her a thoughtful look and nodded no he isn't a good man he said not even according to his lights but i doubt if he could have managed to get away with anything of consequence after he became the administrator he wouldn't have tried it probably unless he was more desperately pushed than i think he has been it would have been too dangerous suppose you wait a week or so and think it over but there's something i want you to do for me immediately joe what's that i want the old house put in order i'm going to live there alone i'm almost twenty-seven 
and that's being enough of an old maid for me to risk canaan's thinking me eccentric isn't it it will think anything you do is all right and once she cried it thought everything i did all wrong yes that's the difference you mean it will commend me because i'm thought rich no no he said meditatively it isn't that it's because everybody will be in love with you quite everybody she asked certainly he replied anybody who didn't would be absurd ah oh, joe she laughed you always were the nicest boy in the world my dear at that he turned toward her with a sudden movement and his lips parted but not to speak she had rested one arm upon the desk and her cheek upon her hand the pen she had picked up still absently held in her fingers touching her lips and it was given to him to know that he would always keep that pen though he would never write with it again the soft lamplight fell across the lower part of her face leaving her eyes which were lowered thoughtfully in the shadow of her hat the room was blotted out in darkness behind her like the background of an antique portrait the office with its dusty corners and shelves and hideous safe had vanished leaving the charming and thoughtful face revealed against an even spacious brownness only ariel and the roses and the lamp were clear and a strange small pain moved from joe's heart to his throat as he thought that this ugly office always before so harsh and grim and lonely loneliest for him when it had been most crowded was now transfigured into something very very different from an office that this place where he sat with a lamp and flowers on a desk between him and a woman who called him my dear must be like like something that people called home and then he leaned across the desk toward her as he said again what he had said a little while before and his voice trembled ariel it is you she looked at him and smiled you'll be here always won't you you're not going away from canaan again for a moment it seemed that she had not heard him then her bright glance at him wavered and fell she rose turning slightly away from him but not so far that he could not see the sudden agitation in her face ah he cried rising too i don't want you to think i don't understand or that i meant i should ever ask you to stay here i couldn't mean that you know i couldn't don't you you know i understand that it's all just your beautiful friendliness don't you it isn't beautiful it's just me joe she said it couldn't be any other way it's enough that you should be here now he went on bravely his voice steady though his hand shook nothing so wonderful as your staying could ever actually happen it's just a light coming into a dark room and out again one day long ago i never forgot it some apple blossoms blew by me as i passed an orchard and it's like that too but oh my dear when you go you'll leave a fragrance in my heart that will last she turned toward him her face suffused with a rosy light you'd rather have died than have said that to me once she cried i'm glad you're weak enough now to confess it he sank down again into his chair and his arms fell heavily on the desk confess it he cried despairingly and you don't deny that you're going away again so it's true i wish i hadn't realized it so soon i think i'd rather have tried to fool myself about it a little longer joe she cried in a voice of great pain you mustn't feel like that how do you know i'm going away again why should i want the old house put in order unless i mean to stay and if i went you know that i could never change you know how i've always cared for you yes he said i do know how it was always the same and it always will be wanted i've shown that she returned quickly yes you say i know how you've cared for me and i do i know how it's just in one certain way jonathan and david isn't that a pretty good way joe never fear that i don't understand he got to his feet again and looked at her steadily thank you joe 
she wiped sudden tears from her eyes don't you be sorry for me he said you think that passing the love of women isn't enough for me no she answered humbly i'll have people at work on the house tomorrow he began and for the i've kept you so long she interrupted helped with a meek sort of gaiety by his matter-of-fact tone good night joe she gave him her hand i don't want you to come with me it isn't very late and this is canaan i want to come with you however he said picking up his hat you can't go alone but you're so tired you she was interrupted there were muffled flying footsteps on the stairs and a shabby little man ran furtively into the room shut the door behind him and set his back against it his face was mottled like a colored map thick lines of perspiration shining across the splotches joe he panted i've got nashville good and he's got me good too i gotta clear out he's fixed me good damn him but he won't trouble nobody joe was across the room like a flying shadow quiet his voice rang like a shot and on the instant his hand fell sharply across the speaker's mouth in there happy he threw an arm across the little man's shoulders and swung him toward the door of the other room happy fear looked up from beneath the down-bent brim of his black slouch hat his eyes followed an imperious gesture toward ariel gave her a brief ghastly stare and stumbled into the inner chamber wait joe said cavalierly to ariel he went in quickly after mr fear and closed the door this was joseph louden attorney at law and to ariel it was like a new face seen in a flashlight not at all the face of joe the sense of his strangeness his unfamiliarity in this electrical aspect overcame her she was possessed by astonishment did she know him so well after all the strange client had burst in shaken beyond belief with some passion unknown to her but joe alert and masterful beyond denial had controlled him instantly had swept him into the other room as with a broom could it be that joe sometimes did other things in the same sweeping fashion she heard a match struck in the next room and the voices of the two men joe's then the other the latter at first broken and protestive but soon rising shrilly she could hear only fragments once she heard the client cry almost scream by god joe i thought claudine had chased him around there to do me and instantly followed loudon's voice steady happy steady the name claudine startled her and although she had had no comprehension of the argo of happy fear the sense of a mysterious catastrophe oppressed her she was sure that something horrible had happened she went to the window touched the shade which disappeared upward immediately and lifted the sash the front of the square building in the courthouse square was bright with lights and figures were passing in and out of the main street doors she remembered that this was the jail claudine the voice of the husband of claudine was like the voice of one lamenting over jerusalem steady happy steady but joe if they get me what'll she do she can't hold her job no longer not after this the door opened and the two men came out joe with his hand on the other's shoulder the splotches had gone from happy's face leaving it an even deathly white he did not glance toward ariel he gazed far beyond all that was about him and suddenly she was aware of a great tragedy the little man's chin trembled and he swallowed painfully nevertheless he bore himself upright and dauntlessly as the two walked slowly to the door like men taking part in some fateful ceremony joe stopped upon the landing at the head of the stairs but happy fear went on clumping heavily down the steps it's all right happy said joe it's better for you to go alone don't you worry i'll see you through it will be all right just as you say joe a breaking voice came back from the foot of the steps just as you say the lawyer turned from the landing and went rapidly to the window beside ariel together they watched the shabby little figure cross the street below and she felt an infinite pathos gathering about it 
as it paused for a moment, hesitating underneath the arc lamp at the corner. They saw the white face lifted as Happy Fear gave one last look about him. Then he set his shoulders sturdily, and steadfastly entered the door of the jail. Joe took a deep breath. Now we'll go, he said. I must be quick. What was it? she asked tremulously, as they reached the street. Can you tell me? Nothing, just an old story. He had not offered her his arm, but walked on hurriedly, a pace ahead of her, though she came as rapidly as she could. She put her hand rather timidly on his sleeve, and without need of more words from her, he understood her insistence. That was the husband of the woman who told you her story, he said. Perhaps it would shock you less if I tell you now that if you heard it tomorrow, as you will, he just shot the other man. Killed him? she gasped. Yes, he answered. He wanted to run away, but I wouldn't let him. He has my word that I'll clear him, and I made him give himself up. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: The Two Canaans. When Joe left Ariel at Judge Pike's gate, she lingered there, her elbows upon the uppermost crossbar, like a village girl at twilight, watching his thin figure vanish into the heavy shadows of the maples then emerge momentarily ghost gray and rapid at the lighted crossing down the street to disappear again under the trees beyond followed a second later by a brownish streak as the mongrel heeled after him when they had passed the second corner she could no longer be certain of them although the street was straight with flat draughtsman-like western directness both figures and joe's quick footsteps merging with the night still she did not turn to go did not alter her position nor cease to gaze down the dim street few lights shone almost all the windows of the houses were darkened and save for the summer murmurs the faint creak of upper branches and the infinitesimal voices of insects in the grass there was silence the pleasant and somnolent hush swathed in which that part of canaan crosses to the far side of the eleventh hour but ariel not soothed by this bomb sought beyond it to see that unquiet canaan whither her old friend bent his steps and found his labor and his dwelling that other canaan where peace did not fall comfortably with the coming of night a place as alien in habit and thought and almost in speech as if it had been upon another continent and yet so strange is the duality of towns it lay but a few blocks distance here about ariel as she stood at the gate of the pike mansion the houses of the good secure of salvation and daily bread were closed and quiet as safely shut and sound asleep as the churches but deeper in the town there was light and life and merry evil industry screened but strong to last until morning there were haunts of haggard merriment in plenty surreptitious chambers where roulette wheels swam beneath dizzied eyes ill-favored bars reached by devious ways where quavering voices offered song and were harshly checked and through the burdened air of this canaan wandered heavy smells of musk like that upon happy fear's wife who must now be so pale beneath her rouge and above all this and for all this and because of all this was that one resort to which joe now made his way that haven whose lights burn all night long whose doors are never closed but are open from dawn until dawn the jail there in that desolate refuge lay happy fear surrendered sturdily by himself at joe's word the picture of the little man was clear and fresh in ariel's eyes and though she had seen him when he was newly come from a thing so terrible that she could not realize it as a fact she felt only an overwhelming pity for him 
She was not even horror-stricken, though she had shuddered. The pathos of the shabby little figure crossing the street toward the lighted doors had touched her. Something about him had appealed to her, for he had not seemed wicked. His face was not cruel, though it was desperate. Perhaps it was partly his very desperation which had moved her. She had understood Joe when he told her that this man was his friend, and comprehended his great fear when he said, I've got to clear him. I promised him. Over and over Joe had reiterated, I've got to save him. I've got to. She had answered gently, Yes, Joe, hurrying to keep up with him. He's a good man, she said. I've known Q better given his chances, and none of this would have happened except for his old-time friendship for me. It was his loyalty. Oh, the rarest and absurdest loyalty that made the first trouble between him and the man he shot. I've got to clear him. Will it be hard? They may make it so. I can only see part of it, surely. When his wife left the office, she met Corey on the street. You saw what a pitiful kind of fool she was, irresponsible and helpless and feather-brained. There are thousands of women like that everywhere. Some of them are court beauties, I dare say, and they always mix things up. But they're most dangerous when they're like Claudine, because then they live among men of action like Corey and Fear. Corey was artful. He spent the day about town telling people that he had always liked Happy, that his ill feeling of yesterday was all gone. He wanted to find him and shake his hand, bury past troubles and be friends. I think he told Claudine the same thing when they met, and convinced the tiny brainlet of his sincerity. Corey was a man who had a way with him, and I can see Claudine flattered at the idea of being peacemaker between two such nice gentlemen as Mr. Corey and Mr. Fear. Her commonest asseveration, quite genuine, too, is that she doesn't like to have the gentleman making trouble about her. So the poor imbecile led him where her husband was waiting. All that Happy knew of this was in her cry afterwards. He was sitting alone when Corey threw open the door and said, I've got you this time, Happy. His pistol was raised but never fired. He waited too long, meaning to establish his case of self-defense, and fears the quickest man I know. Corey fell just inside the door. Claudine stumbled upon him as she came running after him, crying out to her husband that she never meant no trouble, that Corey had sworn to her that he only wanted to shake hands and make up. Other people heard the shot and broke into the room, but they did not try to stop fear. He warned them off and walked out without hindrance and came to me. I've got to clear them. Ariel knew what he meant. She realized the actual thing as it was, and though possessed by a strange feeling that it must all be medieval and not possibly of today, understood that he would have to fight to keep his friend from being killed that the unhappy creature who had run into the office out of the dark stood in high danger of having his neck broken, unless Joe could help him. He made it clear to her that the state would kill Happy if it could, that it would be a point of pride with certain deliberate men holding office to take the life of the little man, that if they did secure his death it would be set down to their efficiency and was even competent as campaign material. I wish to point out, Joe had heard a candidate for re-election vehemently orate, that in addition to the other successful convictions I have named, I and my assistants have achieved the sending of three men to the gallows during my term of office. I can't tell yet, said Joe, at parting. It may be hard. I'm so sorry you saw all this. I... Oh, no, she cried. I want to understand. She was still there at the gate, her elbows resting upon the crossbar, when, a long time after Joe had gone, there came from the alley behind the big backyard the minor courtings of a quartet of those dark strollers who never seem to go to bed, who play by night and playfully pretend to work by day. You know my soul is full of them a troubles. Every morn I can't walk without my stumbles. Then let's go on, keep walking on. These times is awful, and I'm powerful, sick and prolonged. 
she heard a step upon the path behind her and turning saw a white wrapped figure coming toward her mamie she called hush mamie lifted a warning hand the windows are open she whispered they might hear you why haven't you gone to bed oh don't you see mamie answered in deep distress i've been sitting up for you we all thought you were writing letters in your room but after papa and mamma had gone to bed i went in to tell you good night and you weren't there nor anywhere else so i knew you must have gone out i'd been sitting by the front window waiting to let you in but i went to sleep until a little while ago when the telephone bell rang and he got up and answered it he kept talking a long time it was something about the toxin and i'm afraid there's been a murder downtown when he went back to bed i fell asleep again and then those darkies woke me up how on earth did you expect to get in don't you know he always locks up the house i could have rung said ariel oh oh yes miss pike and after she had recovered somewhat asked do you mind telling me where you've been i won't tell him nor mamma either i think after all i was wrong yesterday to follow eugene's advice he meant for the best but i don't think that you weren't wrong ariel put her arm round the other's waist i went to talk over some things with mr loudon i think whispered mamie trembling that you're the bravest girl i ever knew and and i can almost believe there's some good in him since you like him so i know there is and i i think he's had a hard time i want you to know i won't even tell eugene you can tell everybody in the world said ariel and kissed her end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the conquest of canaan by booth tarkington this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen mr sheehan's hints never said the tocsin on the morrow has this community been stirred to deeper indignation than by the cold-blooded and unmitigated brutality of the deliberate murder committed almost under the very shadow of the courthouse cupola last night the victim was not a man of good repute it is true but at the moment of his death he was in the act of performing a noble and generous action which showed that he might have become if he lived a good and law-fearing citizen in brief he went to forgive his enemy and was stretching forth the hand of fellowship when that enemy shot him down not half an hour before his death cory had repeated within the hearing of a dozen men what he had been saying all day as many can testify i want to find my old friend fear and shake hands with him i want to tell him that i forgive him and that i am ashamed of whatever has been my part in the trouble between us he went with that intention to his death the wife of the murderer has confessed that this was the substance of what he said to her and that she was convinced of his peaceful intentions when they reached the room where her husband was waiting for her cory entered first the woman claims now that as they neared the vicinity he hastened forward at a pace which she could not equal naturally her testimony on all points favoring her husband is practically worthless she followed and heard the murdered man speak though what his words were she declares she does not know and of course the murderer after consultation with his lawyer claims that their nature was threatening such a statement in determining the truth is worse than valueless it is known and readily proved that fear repeatedly threatened the deceased life yesterday and there is no question in the mind of any man woman or child who reads these words of the cold-blooded nature of the crime the slayer who had formerly made a murderous attack upon his victim lately quarrelled with him and uttered threats as we have stated upon his life the dead man came to him with protestations of friendship and was struck down a corpse it is understood that the defence will in desperation set up the theory of self-defence based on an unsubstantiated claim that cory entered the room with a drawn pistol 
no pistol was found in the room the weapon with which the deed was accomplished was found upon the person of the murderer when he was seized by the police one chamber discharged another revolver was discovered upon the person of the woman when she was arrested on the scene of the crime this upon being strictly interrogated she said she had picked up from the floor in the confusion thinking it was her husband's and hoping to conceal it the chambers were full and undischarged and we have heard it surmised that the defence means to claim that it was cory's cory doubtless went on his errand of forgiveness unarmed and beyond doubt the second weapon belonged to the woman herself who has an unenviable record the point of all is plainly this here is an unquestionable murder in the first degree and the people of this city and county are outraged and incensed that such a crime should have been committed in their law-abiding and respectable community with whom does the fault lie on whose head is this murder not with the authorities for they do not countenance crime has it come to pass that counting on juggleries of the law criminals believe that they may kill maim burn and slay as they list without punishment is this to be another instance of the law's delays and immunity for a hideous crime compassed by a cunning and cynical trickster of legal technicalities the people of canaan cry out for a speedy trial speedy conviction and the speedy punishment of this cold-blooded and murderous monster if he is not dealt with quickly according to his deserts the climax is upon us and the limit of canaan's patience has been reached one last word and we shall be glad to have its significance noted j loudon esq has been retained for the defence the murderer before being apprehended by the authorities went straight from the scene of his crime to place his retainer in his attorney's pocket how long is this to last the tocsin was quoted on street corners that morning in shop and store and office wherever people talked of the quarry murder and that was everywhere for the people of canaan and of the county round about talked of nothing else women chattered of it in parlor and kitchen men gathered in small groups on the street and shook their heads ominously over it farmers meeting on the road halted their teams and loudly damned the little man in the canaan jail milkmen lingered on back porches over their cans to agree with cooks that it was an awful thing and that if ever any man deserved hanging that their fear deserved it his lawyer along with him tipsy men hammered bars with fists and beer glasses inquiring if there was no rope to be had in the town and joe loudon returning to his office from the little restaurant where he sometimes ate his breakfast heard hisses following him along main street a clerk fat-shouldered blue-aproned pimple-cheeked youth stood in the open doors of a grocery and as he passed stared him in the face and said yeah with extreme disgust joe stopped why he asked mildly the clerk put two fingers in his mouth and whistled shrilly in derision you ought to be run out of town he exclaimed i believe said joe that we've never met before go on you shyster joe looked at him gravely my dear sir he returned you speak to me with the familiarity of an old friend the clerk did not recover so far as to be capable of repartee until joe had entered his own stairway then with a bitter sneer he seized a bad potato from an open barrel and threw it at the mongrel who had paused to examine the landscape the missile failed and respectability after bestowing a slightly injured look upon the clerk followed his master in the office the red-bearded man sat waiting not so red-bearded as of yore however was mr sheehan but grizzled and gray and this morning gray of face too as he sat perspiring and anxious wiping a troubled brow with a black silk handkerchief here's the devil and all to pay at last joe he said uneasily on the other's entrance this is the worst i ever knew 
and I hate to say it, but I doubt you're pulling it off. I've got to, Mike. I hope on my soul there's a chance of it. I like the little man, Joe. So do I. I know you do, my boy. But here's this toxin kicking up the public sentiment, and if there ever was a foreign sheep on earth, it's that same public sentiment. If it weren't for that, Joe flung himself heavily in a chair. There'd not be so much trouble. It's a clear enough case, but don't you see, interrupted Sheehan. The toxins tried it and convicted him aforehand and that if things keep going the way they started today the grand jury is bound to indict him and the trial jury to convict him they wouldn't dare not to what's more they'd want to and they'll rush the trial summer or no summer and i know i know i tell you one thing said the other wiping his forehead with the black handkerchief and that's this my boy last night's business has just about put the cap on the beach for me and i'm sick of it and i'm tired of it i'm ready to quit sir joe looked at him sharply don't you think my old notion of what might be done could be made to pay sheehan laughed whew you and your hints joe how long past have you come around me with em i believe you can make more money mike that's the way you'd put it if you altered the beach a bit make a little countryside restaurant of it you'd say and have good cooking and keep the boys and girls from raising so much hell out there soon you'd have other people coming beside the regular crowd make a little garden on the shore and let em eat at tables under trees and grape arbor well why not asked joe have i been telling you i'm thinking of it it's only your way of hinting that's funny to me your way of saying i'd make more money because you're afraid of preaching at any of us partly because you know the little good it'll be and partly because you have humor well i'm thinking you'll get your way i'm willing to go into the missionary business with you mike said joe angrily but he grew very red and failed to meet the other's eyes i'm not yes you are cried sheehan yes sir it's a thing you probably haven't had the nerve to say to yourself since a boy but that's your notion inside you're little better than a missionary it took me a long while to understand what was driving you but i do now and you've gone the right way about it because we know you stand for us when we're in trouble and fight for us till we get a square deal as you're going to fight for happy now joe looked deeply troubled never mind he said crossly and with visible embarrassment you think you couldn't make more at the beach if you ran it on my plan i'm game to try said sheehan slowly i'm too old to hold em down out there the way i used to could and i'm sick of it sick of it into the very bones of me he wiped his forehead where's claudine held as a witness i'm not sorry for her said the red-bearded man emphatically women of that kind are so light-headed it's a wonder they don't float think of her picking up cory's gun from the floor and hiding it in her clothes took it for granted it was happy's and thought she'd help him by hiding it there's a hard point for you joe to prove the gun belonged to Corey, there's nobody about here could swear to it. I couldn't myself, though I forced him to stick it back in his pocket yesterday. He was a wanderer too, and you'll have to send a keen one to trace him. I'm thinking to find where he got it, so as you can show it in court. I'm going myself. I found out that he came here from Denver, and from where before that, I don't know. But I'll keep on traveling till I get what I want. That's right, my boy exclaimed the other heartily it may be a long trip but you're all the little man has to depend on did you notice the toxins didn't even give him the credit for giving himself up yes said joe it's part of their game did it strike you now mr sheehan asked earnestly leaning forward in his chair did it strike you that the toxin was aiming more to do happy harm because of you than himself yes joe looked sadly out of the window i've thought that over and it seemed possible that i might do happy more good by giving his case to some other lawyer no sir exclaimed the proprietor of beaver beach loudly they begun their attack they're bound to keep it up and they'd managed to turn it to the discredit of both of you besides happy wouldn't have no other lawyer 
He'd rather be hung with you fighting for him than be cleared by anybody else. I believe it on my soul, I do. But look here, he went on, leaning still farther forward. And I want to know if it struck you this morning the toxin attack you in a way that was somehow villainer than ever before. Yes, replied Joe, because it was an aim to strike where it would most count. It ain't only that, said the other excitedly. It ain't only that. I want you to listen. Now see here. The toxin is pike, and the town is pike. I mean the town you naturally belong to, ain't it? In a way, I suppose, yes. In a way, echoed the other scornfully. You know it is. Even as a boy, Pike disliked you and hated the kind of a boy you was. You wasn't respectable, and he was. You wasn't rich, and he was. You had a grin on your face when you met him on the street. The red-bearded man broke off in a gesture from Joe and exclaimed sharply, Don't deny it. I know what you was like. You wasn't impudent, but you looked at him as if you saw through him. Now listen, and I'll lead you somewhere. You run with riffraff, naggers and even. Mr. Sheehan lifted a forefinger solemnly and shook it at his auditor. And even with the Irish. Now I ask you this. You had one part of Canaan from you from the start. My part, that is. But the other's against you. That part's Pike. And it's the ruling part. Yes, Mike, said Joe wearily. In the spirit of things, I know. No, sir, cried the other. That's the trouble you don't know. There's more in Canaan that ye've understood. Listen to this. Why was the toxin's attack harder this morning than ever before? On your soul, didn't it sound so bitter that it sounded disparate? Now why? It looked to me as if it had started to ruin ye, this time for good and all. Why? What have ye had to do with Martin Pike lately? Has the old wolf got to injure ye? Mr. Sheehan's voice rose, and his eyes gleamed under bushy brows. Think, he finished. What's happened lately to make him bite so hard? There were some faded roses on the desk, and as Joe's haggard eyes fell upon them, the answer came. What makes you think Judge Pike isn't trustworthy? he had asked Ariel and her reply had been nothing very definite unless it was his look when i told him that i meant to ask you to take charge of things for me he got slowly and amazedly to his feet you've got it he said you see cried mike sheehan slapping his thigh with a big hand on my soul i have the penetration you don't need to tell me one thing except this i told you i'd lead you somewhere haven't I kept me word? Yes, said Joe. But I had the penetration, exclaimed Mr. Sheehan. Should I miss my guess if I said that ye think Pike may be scared you'll stumble on his track in some queer performances? Should I miss it? No, said Joe. You wouldn't miss it. Just one thing more. The red-bearded man rose, mopping the inner band of his straw hat. In the matter of your running for mayor now. Joe, who had begun to pace up and down the room, made an impatient gesture. Shawl, he interrupted. But his friend stopped him with a hand laid on his arm. Don't be treating it as clean out of all possibility, Joe Loudon. If you do, it shows you haven't sense to know that nobody can say what way the wind's blowing week after next. All the boys, won't you? Louis Farbach, won't you? and louis has a big say who is it that doesn't want you canaan said joe hold it it's pike's canaan you mean if you get the nomination you'll be elected wouldn't you i couldn't be nominated i ain't claiming you'd get martin pike's vote returned mr sheehan sharply though i don't say it's impossible you've got to beat him that's all you've got to do to him what he's done to you and what he's trying to do now worse than ever before well there may be ways to do it and if he tempts me enough i may forget my troth and honor as a noble gentleman and help you with a word you'd never guess yourself you've hinted at such mysteries before mike joe smiled i'll be glad to know what you mean if there's anything in them it may come to that said the other with some embarrassment 
It may come to that some day, if the old wolf presses me too hard in the matter of trying to get the little man across the street hanged by the neck and yourself mobbed for helping him. But today I'll say no more. Very well, Mike. Joe turned wearily to his desk. I don't want you to break any promises. Mr. Sheehan had gone to the door, but he paused on the threshold and wiped his forehead again. And I don't want to break any, he said. But if ever the time should come when I couldn't help it, he lowered his voice to a hoarse but piercing whisper. That will be the devouring angel's day for Martin Pike. End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the conquest of canaan by booth tarkington this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter 18 in the heat of the day it was a morning of the warmest week of mid-july and canaan lay inert and helpless beneath a broiling sun the few people who moved about the streets went languidly keeping close to the wall on the shady side the women in thin white fabrics, the men, often coatless, carrying palm-leaf fans and replacing collars with handkerchiefs. In the courthouse yard the maple leaves, gray with blown dust and grown to great breadth, drooped heavily, depressing the long, motionless branches with their weight, so low that the four or five shabby idlers upon the benches beneath now and then flicked them sleepily with whittled sprigs. The doors and windows of the stores stood open, displaying limp wares of trade, but few tokens of life. The clerks, hanging over dim counters as far as possible from the glare in front, gossiping fragmentarily, usually about the Corey murder, and anon upon a subject suggested by the sight of an occasional pedestrian passing perspiring by with scrooged eyelids and purpling skin. From street and sidewalk transparent hot waves swarm up and dance themselves into nothing, while from the river bank a half mile away came a sound hotter than even the locust's midsummer rasp, the drone of a planing mill. A chance boy lying prone in the grass of the courthouse yard was annoyed by the relentless chant and lifted his head to mock it. Arrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
among those who held to this opinion being mrs louden and her sister joe's step-aunt upon only one point was everybody agreed that twelve men could not be found in the county who could be so far persuaded and befuddled by louden that they would dare to allow happy fear to escape the women of canaan incensed by the terrible circumstance of the case as the tocsin colored it a man shot down in the act of begging his enemy's forgiveness clamored as loudly as the men there was only the difference that the latter vociferated for the hanging of happy their good ladies used the word punishment and yet while the place rang with condemnation of the little man in the jail and his attorney there were voices here and there uplifted on the other side people existed it astonishingly appeared who liked happy fear these were for the greater part obscure and even darkling in their lives yet quite demonstrably human beings able to smile suffer leap run and to entertain fancies even to have according to their degree a certain rudimentary sense of right and wrong in spite of which they strongly favored the prisoner's acquittal precisely on that account it was argued an acquittal would outrage canaan and lay it open to untold danger such people needed a lesson the tocsin interviewed the town's great ones printing their opinions on the heinousness of the crime and the character of the defendant's lawyer the hon p j parrott who so ably represented this county in the legislature some fourteen years ago could scarcely restrain himself when approached by a reporter as to his sentiments anent the repulsive deed i should like to know how long canaan is going to put up with this sort of business were his words i am a law-abiding citizen and i have served faithfully and with my full endeavor and ability to enact the laws and statutes of my state but there is a point in my patience i would state which lawbreakers and their lawyers may not safely pass of what use are our most solemn enactments i may even ask of what use is the legislature itself chosen by the will of the people if they are to ruthlessly be set aside by criminals and their shifty protectors the blame should be put upon the lawyers who by tricks enable such rascals to escape the rigors of the carefully enacted laws the fruits of the solon's labor more than upon the criminals themselves in this case if there is any miscarriage of justice i will say here and now that in my opinion the people of this county will be sorely tempted and while i do not believe in lynch law yet if that should be the result it is my unalterable conviction that the vigilantes may well turn their attention to the lawyers or lawyer who bring about such miscarriage i am sick of it the tocsin did not print the interview it obtained from louis farback the same louis farback who long ago had owned a beer saloon with a little room behind the bar where a shabby boy sometimes played dominoes and seven-up with loafers. Not quite the same Louis Farbach, however, in outward circumstance, for he was now the brewer of Farbach beer, and making Canaan famous. His rise had been Teutonic and sure, and he contributed one-twentieth of his income to the German orphan asylum, and one-tenth to his party's campaign fund the twentieth saved the orphans from the county while the tithe gave the county to his party he occupied a kitchen chair enjoying the society of some chickens in a wired enclosure behind the new italian villa he had erected in that part of canaan where he would be most uncomfortable and he looked woodenly at the reporter when the latter put his question have you any acquaintance of mr fear he inquired in return with no expression decipherable either upon his gargantuan face or in his heavily enfolded eyes no sir replied the reporter grinning i never ran across him dat is good thing for you said mr farback stonily he is not a man people better try to run across it is what cory tried now cory is dead the reporter slightly puzzled lit a cigarette see here mr farbach he urged i only want a word or two about this thing 
and you might give me a brief expression concerning the man Loudon besides. Just a hint of what you think of his influence here, you know, and of the kind of sharp work he practices, something like that. I see, said the brewer slowly. Happy fear I have known for a good many years. He is a good friend of mine. What? Joe Loudon is a better one, continued Mr. Farbach, turning again to stare at his chickens. Get to it. What? Get to it, repeated the other without passion, without anger, without any expression whatsoever. Get to it. The reporter's prejudice against the German nation dated from that moment. There were others here and there who were less self-contained than the brewer. A farmhand struck a fellow laborer in the forest field for speaking ill of Joe, and the unraveling of a strange street fight one day disclosed as its cause a like resentment on the part of a blind broom-maker, engendered by a like offense. The broom-maker's companion, reading the tocsin as the two walked together, had begun the quarrel by remarking that happy fear ought to be hanged once for his own sake and twice more to show up that shyster loudon warm words followed leading to extremely material conflict in which in spite of his blindness the broom-maker had so much the best of it that he was removed from the triumphant attitude he had assumed toward the person of his adversary which was an admirable imitation of the dismounted st george and the dragon and conveyed to the jail keenest investigation failed to reveal anything oblique in the man's record to the astonishment of canaan there was nothing against him he was blind and moderately poor but a respectable hard-working artisan and a pride to the church in which he was what has been called an active worker it was discovered that his sensitiveness to his companion's attack on joseph loudon arose from the fact that joe had obtained the acquittal of an imbecile sister of the blind man a two-thirds witted woman who had been charged with bigamy the tocsin made what it could of this and so dexterously that the wrath of canaan was one farther jot increased against the shyster ah the town was hot inside and out let us consider the forum was there ever before such a summer for the national house corner how voices first thundered there then cracked and piped is not to be rendered in all the tales of the fathers one who would make vivid the great doings must indeed dip his brush in earthquake and eclipse even then he could but picture the credible and must despair of this the silence of eskew arp not that eskew held his tongue not that he was chary of speech no o oh, tempora o oh, mores no but that he refused the subject in hand that he eschewed expression upon it and resolutely drove the argument in other directions that he achieved such superbly unarp-like inconsistency and with such rich material for his sardonic humours not at arm's length not even so far as his fingertips but beneath his very palms he rejected it this was the impossible fact eskew there is no option but to declare was no longer eskew it is the truth since the morning when ariel tabor came down from joe's office leaving her offering of white roses in that dingy dusty shady place eskew had not been himself his comrades observed it somewhat in a physical difference one of those alterations which may come upon men of his years suddenly like a sea change his face was whiter his walk slower his voice filled thinner he creaked louder when he rose or sat old always from his boyhood he had in the turn of a hand become aged but such things come and such things go after eighty there are ups and downs people fading away one week bloom out pleasantly the next and resiliency is not at all a pattern belonging to youth alone the material change in mr arp might have been thought little worth remarking what caused peter bradbury squire and buckaloo and the colonel to shake their heads secretly to one another 
and wonder if their good old friend's mind had not begun to go was something very different to come straight down to it he not only abstained from all argument upon the cory murder and the case of happy fear refusing to discuss either in any terms or under any circumstances but he also declined to speak of ariel tabor or of joseph louden or of their affairs singular or plural masculine feminine or neuter or in any declension not a word committal or non-committal none and his face when he was silent fell into sorrowful and troubled lines at first they merely marvelled then squire buckaloo dared to tempt him eskew's faded eyes showed a blue gleam but he withstood speaking of babylon to the disparagement of chicago they sought to lead him into what he evidently would not employing many devices but the old man was wily and often carried them far afield by secret ways of his own this hot morning he had done that thing they were close upon him pressing him hard when he roused that outburst which had stirred the idlers on the benches in the courthouse yard squire buckaloo sidelong at the others but squarely at eskew had volunteered the information that cory was a reformed priest stung by the mystery of eskew's silence the squire's imagination had become magically gymnastic and if anything under heaven could have lifted the veil this was the thing mr harp's reply may be referenced i consider he said deliberately that james g blaine's furrin policy was childish what's more i never thought much of him this undefied ajax and every trace of the matter in hand went to the four winds eskew like rome was saved by a cackle in which he joined and a few moments later as the bench loafers saw was pulled down into his seat by the colonel the voices of the fathers fell to a pitch of ordinary discourse the drowsy town was quiet again the whine of the planing mill boring its way through the sizzling air to every wakening ear far away on a quiet street it sounded faintly like the hum of a bee across a creek and was drowned in the noise of men at work on the old tabor house it seemed the only busy place in canaan that day the shade of the big beech trees which surrounded it affording some shelter from the destroying sun to the dripping laborers who were sawing hammering painting plumbing papering and ripping open old and new packing boxes there were many changes in the old house pleasantly in keeping with its simple character airy enlargements now almost completed so that some of the rooms were already finished and stood furnished and immaculate ready for tenancy in that which had been roger tabor's studio sat ariel alone she had caused some chests and cases stored there to be opened and had taken out of them a few of roger's canvases and set them along the wall tears filled her eyes as she looked at them seeing the tragedy of labor the old man had expended upon them but she felt the recompense hard tight literal as they were he had had his moment of joy in each of them before he saw them coldly and knew the truth and he had been given his years of paris at last and had seen how the other fellows did it a heavy foot strode through the hall coming abruptly to a halt in the doorway and turning she discovered martin pike his big henry the eighth face flushed more with anger than with the heat his hat was upon his head and remained there nor did he offer any token or word of greeting whatever but demanded to know when the work upon the house had been begun the second morning after my return she answered i want to know he pursued why it was kept secret from me and i want to know quick secret she echoed with a wave of her hand to indicate the noise which the workmen were making upon whose authority was it begun mine who else could give it look here he said advancing toward her don't you try to fool me you haven't done all of this by yourself who hired these workmen 
remembering her first interview with him she rose quickly before he could come near her mr louden made most of the arrangements for me she replied quietly before he went away he will take charge of everything when he returns you haven't forgotten that i told you i intended to place my affairs in his hands he had started forward but at this he stopped and stared at her inarticulately you remember she said her hands resting negligently upon the back of the chair surely you remember she was not in the least afraid of him but coolly watchful of him this had been her habit with him since her return she had seen little of him except at table when he was usually grimly laconic though now and then she would hear him joking heavily with sam warden in the yard or with evidently humorous intent groaning at mamie over eugene's health but it had not escaped ariel that he was on his part watchful of herself and upon his guard with a wariness in which she was sometimes surprised to believe that she saw an almost haggard apprehension he did not answer her question and it seemed to her as she continued steadily to meet his hot eyes that he was trying to hold himself under some measure of control and a vain effort it proved you go back to my house he burst out shouting hoarsely you get back there you stay there no she said moving between him and the door mamie and i are going for a drive you go back to my house he followed her waving an arm fiercely at her don't you come around here trying to run over me you talk about your affairs all you've got on earth is this two for a nickel old shack over your head and a bushel basket of distillery stock that you can sell by the pound for old paper he threw the words in her face the bull bass voice seamed and cracked with falsetto old paper old rags old iron bottles old clothes you talk about your affairs who are you rothschild you haven't got any affairs not a look not a word not a motion of his escaped her in all the fury of sound and gesture in which he seemed fairly to envelop himself least of all did that shaking of his the quivering of jaw and temple the tumultuous agitation of his hands evade her watchfulness when did you find this out she said very quickly after you became administrator he struck the back of the chair she had vacated a vicious blow with his open hand no you spendthrift all oh, there was to your grandfather when you buried him was a basket full of distillery stock i tell you old paper can't you hear me old paper old rags you've sent me the same income she lifted her voice to interrupt you've made the same quarterly payments since his death that you made before if you knew why did you do that he had been shouting at her with the frantic and incredulous exasperation of an intolerant man utterly unused to opposition his face empurpled his forehead dripping and his hands ruthlessly pounding the back of the chair but this straight question stripped him suddenly of gesture and left him standing limp and still before her pale spotches beginning to show on his hot cheeks if you knew why did you do it she repeated you wrote me that my income was from dividends and i knew and thought nothing about it but if the stock which came to me was worthless how could it pay dividends it did not he answered huskily that distillery stock i tell you isn't worth the matches to burn it but there's been no difference in my income she persisted steadily why can you explain that to me yes i can he replied and it seemed to her that he spoke with a pallid and bitter desperation like a man driven to the wall i can if you think you want to know i do i sent it you mean from your own i mean it was my own money she had not taken her eyes from his which met her straightly and angrily and at this she leaned forward gazing at him with profound scrutiny why did you send it she asked charity he answered after palpable hesitation her eyes widened and she leaned back against the lintel of the door staring at him incredulously charity she echoed in a whisper 
Perhaps he mistook her amazement at his performance for dismay caused by the sense of her own position, for as she seemed to weaken before him, the strength of his own habit of dominance came back to him. Charity, madam, he broke out, shouting intolerably. Charity, do you hear? I was a friend of the man that made the money you and your grandfather squandered. I was a friend of Jonas Tabor, I say. That's why I was willing to support you for a year and over, rather than let a niece of his suffer. Suffer, she cried. Support. You sent me a hundred thousand francs. The white splotches which had mottled Martin Pike's face disappeared, as if they had been suddenly splotched with hot red. You go back to my house, he said. What I sent you only shows the extent of my effrontery. The word rang through the whole house so loudly and clearly did she strike it, ring in his ears till it stung like a castigation. It was ominous, portentous of justice and of disaster. There was more than doubt of him in it. There was conviction. He fell back from this word, and when he again advanced, Ariel had left the house. She had turned the next corner before he came out of the gate, and as he passed his own home on his way downtown, he saw her white dress mingling with his daughter's near the horse block beside the fire, where the two, with their arms about each other, stood waiting for Sam Warden and the open summer carriage. Judge Pike walked on, the white splotches reappearing like a pale rash upon his face. A yellow butterfly zigzagged before him knee-high across the sidewalk he raised his foot and half kicked at it end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the conquest of canaan by booth tarkington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen eskew arp as the judge continued his walk down Main Street, he wished profoundly that the butterfly, which exhibited no annoyance, had been of greater bulk and more approachable, and it was the evil fortune of Joe's mongrel to encounter him in the sinister humor of such a wish unfulfilled. Respectability dwelt at Beaver Beach under the care of Mr. Sheehan until his master should return, and Sheehan was kind but the small dog found the world lonely and time long without joe he had grown more and more restless and at last this hot morning having managed to evade the eye of all concerned in his keeping made off unobtrusively partly by swimming and reaching the road cantered into town his ears erect with anxiety Bent upon reaching the familiar office, he passed the grocery from the doorway of which the pimply-cheeked clerk had thrown a bad potato at him a month before. The same clerk had just laid down the toxin as respectability went by, and, inspired to great deeds in behalf of justice and his native city, he rushed to the door, lavishly seized, this time a perfectly good potato, and hurled it with a result which ecstasized him for it took the mongrel fairly aside the head, which it matched in size. The luckless respectability's purpose to reach Joe's stairway had been entirely definite, but upon this violence he forgot it momentarily. It is not easy to keep things in mind when one is violently smitten on mouth, nose, cheek, eye, and ear by a missile large enough to strike them simultaneously. Yelping and half-blinded, he deflected to cross Main Street. Judge Pike had elected to cross in the opposite direction, and the two met in the middle of the street. The encounter was miraculously fitted to the judge's need. Here was no butterfly, but a solid body, light withal, a wet, muddy, and dusty yellow dog eminently kickable. The man was heavily built about the legs, and the vigor of what he did may have been additionally inspired by his recognition of the mongrel as Joe Loudon's. The impact of his toe upon the little runner's side was momentous, and the latter rose into the air. The judge hopped as one hops who, unshod in the night, discovers an unexpected chair. Let us be reconciled to his pain and not reproach the gods with it. 
for two of his unintending adversary's ribs were cracked the dog thus again deflected retraced his tracks shrieking distractedly and by one of those ironical twists which karma reserves for the tales of the fated dived for blind safety into the store commanded by the ecstatic and inimical clerk there were shouts the sleepy square beginning to wake up the boy who had mocked the planing mill got to his feet calling upon his fellows the beach loafers strolled to the street the aged men stirred and rose from their chairs faces appeared in the open windows of offices sales ladies and gentlemen came to the doorways of the trading places so that when respectability emerged from the grocery he had a notable audience for the scene he enacted with a brass dinner bell tied to his tail another potato flung by the pimpled uproarious prodigal clerk added to the impetus of his flight a shower of pebbles from the hands of exhilarated boys dented the soft asphalt about him the hideous clamor of the pursuing bell increased as he turned the next corner running distractedly the dead town had come to life and its inhabitants gladly risked the dangerous heat in the interests of sport whereby it was a merry chase the little dog led around the block for thus some destructive instinct drove him he could not stop with the unappeasable terror clanging at his heels and the increasing crowd yelling in pursuit but he turned to the left at each corner and thus came back to pass joe's stairway again unable to pause there or anywhere unable to do anything except to continue his hapless flight poor meteor round the block he went once more and still no chance at that empty stairway where perhaps he thought there might be succor and safety blood was upon his side where martin pike's boot had crashed foam and blood hung upon his jaws and lolling tongue he ran desperately keeping to the middle of the street and not howling set himself despairingly to outstrip the terror the mob disdaining the sun superbly pursued as closely as it could throwing bricks and rocks at him striking at him with clubs and sticks happy fear playing the tic-tac-toe right hand against left in his cell heard the uproar made out something of what was happening and though unaware that it was a friend whose life was sought discovered a similarity to his own case and prayed to his dim gods that the quarry might get away mad dog they yelled mad dog and there were some who cried joe loudon's dog that being equally as exciting and explanatory three times round and still the little fugitive maintained a lead a gray helmeted policeman a big fellow had joined the pursuit he had children at home who might be playing in the street and the thought of what might happen to them if the mad dog should head that way resolved him to be cool and steady he was falling behind so he stopped on the corner trusting that respectability would come round again he was right and the flying brownish things streaked along main street passing the beloved stairway for the fourth time the policeman lifted his revolver fired twice missed once but caught him with a second shot in a forepaw clipping off a fifth toe one of the small claws that grow above the foot and are always in trouble this did not stop him but the policeman afraid to risk another shot because of the crowd waited for him to come again and many others seeing the hopeless circuit the mongrel followed did likewise armed with bricks and clubs among them was the pimply clerk who had been inspired to commandeer a pitchfork from a hardware store when the fifth round came respectability's race was run he turned into main street at a broken speed limping parched voiceless flecked with blood and foam snapping feebly at the showering rocks but still indomitably a little ahead of the hunt there was no yelp left in him he was too thoroughly winded for that but in his brilliant and despairing eyes shone the agony of a cry louder than the tongue of a dog could utter oh master oh all the god i know 
where are you in my mortal need now indeed he had a gauntlet to run for the street was lined with those who awaited him while the pursuit grew closer behind a number of the hardiest stood squarely in his path and he hesitated for a second which gave the opportunity for a surer aim and many missiles struck him let him have it now officer said eugene bantry standing with judge pike at the policeman's elbow here's your chance but before the revolver could be discharged respectability had begun to run again hobbling on three legs and dodging feebly a heavy stone struck him on the shoulder and he turned across the street making for the national house corner where the joyful clerk brandished his pitchfork going slowly he almost touched the pimply one as he passed and the clerk already rehearsing in his mind the honors which should follow the brave stroke raised the tines above the little dog's head for the coup de grace they did not descend and the daring youth failed of fame as the laurel almost embraced his brows a hickory walking-stick was thrust between his legs and he expecting to strike received a blow upon the temple sufficient for his present undoing and bedazzlement he went over backwards and the pitchfork not the thing to hold poised on high when one is knocked down fell with the force he had intended for respectability upon his own shin a train had pulled into the station and a tired travel-worn young man descending from a sleeper walked rapidly up the street to learn the occasion at what appeared to be a riot when he was close enough to understand its nature he dropped his bag and came on at top speed shouting loudly to the battered mongrel who tried with his remaining strength to leap toward him through a cordon of kicking legs while eugene bantry again called to the policeman to fire if he does damn you i'll kill him joe saw the revolver raised and then eugene being in his way he ran full tilt into the step-brother with all his force sending him to the earth and went on literally over him as he lay prone upon the asphalt that being the shortest way to respectability the next instant the mongrel was in his master's arms and weakly licking his hands but it was eskew arp who had saved the little dog for it was his stick which had tripped the clerk and his hand which had struck him down all his bodily strength had departed in that effort but he staggered out into the street toward joe joe louden called the veteran in a loud voice joe louden and suddenly reeled the colonel and squire buckaloo were making their way toward him but joe holding the dog to his breast with one arm threw the other about eskew it's a town it's a town the old fellow flung himself free from the supporting arm it's a town you couldn't even trust a yellow dog to he sank back upon joe's shoulder speechless an open carriage had driven through the crowd the colored driver urged by two ladies upon the back seat and martin pike saw it stopped by the group in the middle of the street where joe stood the wounded dog held to his breast by one arm the old man white and half fainting supported by the other martin pike saw this and more he saw ariel tabor and his own daughter leaning from the carriage the arms of both pityingly extended to joe louden and his two burdens while the stunned and silly crowd stood round them staring clouds of dust settling down upon them through the hot air End of chapter 19「Twenty of the Conquest of Canaan by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three Are Enlisted. Now, in that blazing noon, Canaan looked upon a strange sight an open carriage whirling through Main Street behind two galloping bays. Upon the back seat, a ghostly white old man with closed eyes supported by two pale ladies his head upon the shoulder of the taller while beside the driver a young man whose coat and hands were bloody worked over the hurts of an injured dog 
Sam Warden's whip sang across the horses, lather gathered on their flanks, and Ariel's voice steadily urged on the pace. Quicker, Sam, if you can, for there was little breath left in the body of Eskew Arp. Mamie, almost as white as the old man, was silent, but she had not hesitated in her daring now that she had been taught to dare. She had not come to be Ariel's friend and honest follower for nothing. And it was Mamie who had cried to Joe to lift Eskew into the carriage. You must come, too, she said. We will need you. And so it came to pass that under the eyes of Canaan, Joe Loudon rode in Judge Pike's carriage at the bidding of Judge Pike's daughter. Toward Ariel's own house they sped with the stricken octogenarian, for he was alone in the world, and she would not take him to the cottage where he had lived for many years by himself, a bleak little house, a derelict of the early days left stranded far down in the town between a woolen mill and the waterworks. The workmen were beginning their dinners under the big trees, but as Sam Warden drew in the lathered horses at the gate, they set down their tin buckets hastily and ran to help Joe lift the old man out. Carefully they bore him into the house and laid him upon a bed in one of the finished rooms. He did not speak or move, and the workmen uncovered their heads as they went out. But Joe knew they were mistaken. "'It's all right, Mr. Arp,' he said, as Ariel knelt by the bed with water and restoratives. "'It's all right. Don't you worry.' Then the veteran's lips twitched and though his eyes remained closed joe saw that eskew understood for he gasped feebly positively no free seats to mrs loudon sewing at an upstairs window the sight of her stepson descending from judge pike's carriage was sufficiently startling but when she saw mamie pike take respectability from his master's arms and carry him tenderly indoors while Joe and Ariel occupied themselves with Mr. Arp. The good lady sprang to her feet as if she had been stung, regardlessly sending her work-basket and its contents scattering over the floor, and ran down the stairs three steps at a time. At the front door she met her husband entering for his dinner, and she leaped at him. Had he seen? What was it? What had happened? Mr. Loudon rubbed his chin-beard, indulging himself in a pause which was like to prove fatal to his companion, finally vouchsafing the information that the doctor's buggy was just turning the corner. Erskew Arp had suffered a stroke, it was said, and, in Loudon's opinion, was a mighty sick man. His spouse replied in no uncertain terms that she had seen quite that much for herself, urging him to continue which he did with a deliberation that caused her to recall her wedding day with a gust of passionate self-reproach. Presently he managed to interrupt, reminding her that her dining-room windows commanded as comprehensive a view of the next house as did the front steps. And after a time her housewifely duty so far prevailed over her indignation at the man's unwholesome solidity that she followed him down the hall to preside over the meal, not, however, to partake largely of it herself. Mr. Loudon had no information of Eugene's mishap, nor had Mrs. Loudon any suspicion that all was not well with the young man, and hearing him enter the front door she called to him that his dinner was waiting. Eugene, however, made no reply and went upstairs to his own apartment without coming into the dining-room. A small crowd, neighboring children, servants, and negroes had gathered about Ariel's gate, and Mrs. Loudon watched the working men disperse this assembly, gather up their tools, and depart. Then Mamie came out of the house, and, bowing sadly to three old men who were entering the gate as she left it, stepped into her carriage and drove away. The newcomers, Colonel Flitcroft, Squire Buckaloo, and Peter Bradbury, glanced at the doctor's buggy shook their heads at one another and slowly went up to the porch where joe met them mrs loudon uttered a sharp exclamation for the colonel shook hands with her stepson perhaps flitcroft himself was surprised he had offered his hand almost unconsciously 
and the greeting was embarrassed and perfunctory but his two companions each in turn gravely followed his lead and joe's set face flushed a little it was the first time in many years that men of their kind in canaan had offered him this salutation he wouldn't have let me send for you he told them he said he knew you'd be here soon without that and he led the way up to eskew's bedside joe and the doctor had undressed the old man and had put him into night gear of roger tabor's taken from an antique chest it was soft and yellow and much more like color than the face above it for the white hair on the pillar was not whiter than that yet there was a strange youthfulness in the eyes of eskew an eerie inexplicable luminous live look the thin cheeks seemed fuller than they had been for years and though the heavier lines of age and sorrow could be seen they appeared to have been half erased he lay not in sunshine but in clear light the windows were open the curtains restrained for he had asked them not to darken the room the doctor was whispering in a doctor's way to ariel at the end of the room opposite the bed when the three old fellows came in none of them spoke immediately and though all three cleared their throats with what they meant for casual cheerfulness to indicate that the situation was not at all extraordinary or depressing it was to be seen that the colonel's chin trembled under his moustache and his comrades showed similar small and unwilling signs of emotion eskew spoke first well boys he said and smiled that seemed to make it more difficult for the others the three white heads bent silently over the fourth upon the pillow and ariel saw waveringly for her eyes suddenly filled that the colonel laid his unsteady hand upon eskew's which was outside the coverlet it's it's not said the old soldier gently it's not on on both sides is it eskew mr arp moved his hand slightly in answer it ain't paralysis he said they call it shock and exhaustion but it's more than that it's just my time i've heard the call we've all been sliding on thin ice this long time and it's broke under me ask you ask you remonstrated peter bradbury you oughtn't to talk that away you only kind of overdone a little heat of the day too and peter interrupted the sick man with feeble asperity did you ever manage to fool me in your life no eskew well you're not doing it now two tears suddenly loosed themselves from squire buckaloo's eyelids despite his hard endeavor to wink them away and he turned from the bed too late to conceal what had happened there ain't any call to feel bad said eskew it might have happened any time in the night maybe at my house and all alone but here's ariel tabor brought me to her own home and taken care of me i couldn't ask any better way to go could i i don't know what we'll do stammered the colonel if you you talk about going away from us eskew we we couldn't get along well sir i'm almost kind of glad to think mr arp murmured between short struggles for breath that it'll be quieter on the national house corner a moment later he called the doctor faintly and asked for a restorative there he said in a stronger voice and with a gleam of satisfaction in the vindication of his belief that he was dying i was almost gone then i know he lay panting for a moment then spoke the name of joe louton joe came quickly to the bedside i want you to shake hands with colonel and peter and buckaloo we did answered the colonel infinitely surprised and troubled we shook hands outside before we came in do it again said eskew i want to see you and joe making shift to smile was suddenly blinded so that he could not see the wrinkled hands extended to him and was fain to grope for them god knows why we didn't all take his hand long ago said eskew harp i didn't because i was stubborn i hated to admit that the argument was against me i acknowledge it now before him and before you and i want the word of it carried 
it's all right mr arp began joe tremulously you mustn't hark to me the old man's voice lifted higher if you had ever whimpered or give back talk or broke out the wrong way it would have been different but you never did i've watched you and i know and you've just gone your own way alone with the town against you because you got a bad name as a boy and once we'd given you that everything you did or didn't do we had to give you a blacker one that's time someone stood by you harry tabor will do that with all her soul and body she told me once i thought a good deal of you she knew but i want these three old friends of mine to do it too i was boys with them and they'll do it i think they've even stood up for you against me sometimes but mostly for the sake of the argument i reckon but now they must do it when there's more to stand against than just my talk they saw it all to-day the meanest thing i ever knew i could have stood it all except that before they could prevent him he had struggled half upright in bed lifting a clenched fist at the town beyond the windows but by god when they got so low they tried to kill your dog he fell back choking in joe's arms and the physician bent over him but eskew was not gone and ariel upon the other side of the room could hear him whispering again for the restorative she brought it and when he had taken it went quickly out of doors to the side yard she sat upon a workman's bench under the big trees hidden from the street shrubbery and breathing deeply of the shaded air began to cry quietly through the windows came the quavering voice of the old man lifted again insistent a little querulous but determined responses sounded intermittently from the colonel from peter and from buckaloo and now and then a sorrowful yet almost humorous protest from joe and so she made out that the veteran swore his three comrades to friendship with joseph louden to lend him their countenance in all matters to stand by him in weal and woe to speak only good of him and defend him in the town of canaan thus did eskew arp on the verge of parting this life render justice the gate clicked and ariel saw eugene approaching through the shrubbery one of his hands was bandaged a thin strip of court plaster crossed his forehead from his left eyebrow to his hair and his thin and agitated face showed several light scratches i saw you come out he said i've been waiting to speak to you the doctor told us to let him have his way in whatever he might ask ariel wiped her eyes i'm afraid that means i didn't come to talk about erskew arp interrupted eugene i'm not laboring under any anxiety about him you needn't be afraid he's too sour to accept his con so readily please lower your voice she said rising quickly and moving away from him toward the house but as he followed insisting sharply that he must speak with her she walked out of earshot of the windows and stopping turned toward him very well she said is there a message from mamie at this he faltered and hung fire have you been to see her she continued i am anxious to know if her goodness and bravery caused her any any discomfort at home you may set your mind at rest about that returned eugene i was there when the judge came home to dinner i suppose you fear he may have been rough with her for taking my stepbrother into the carriage he was not on the contrary he spoke very quietly to her and went on out toward the stables but i haven't come to you to talk of judge pike either no said ariel i don't care particularly to hear of him but of mamie nor of her either he broke out i want to talk of you there was not mistaking him no possibility of misunderstanding the real passion that shook him and her startled eyes portrayed her comprehension yes i see you understand he cried bitterly that's because you've seen others the same way god help me he went on striking his forehead with his open hand that young fool of a bradbury told me you refused him only yesterday he was proud of even rejection from you and there's norbert and half a dozen others perhaps already since you've been here he flung out his arms in ludicrous savage despair 
and here am i ah yes she cut him off it is of yourself that you want to speak after all not of me look here he vociferated are you going to marry that joe louden i want to know whether you are or not he gave me this and this today he touched his bandaged hand and plastered forehead he ran into me over me for nothing when i was not on my guard struck me down stamped on me she turned upon him cheeks aflame eyes sparkling and dry mr bantry she cried he did a good thing and now i want you to go home i want you to go home and try if you can discover anything in yourself that is worthy of mamie and of what she showed herself to be this morning if you can you will have found something that i could like she went rapidly toward the house and he was senseless enough to follow babbling what do you think i'm made of you trample on me as he did i can't bear everything i tell you but she lifted her hand with such imperious will that he stopped short then through the window of the sick-room came clearly the querulous voice i tell you it was i heard him speak just now out there in the yard that no-account stepbrother of joe's what if he is a hired hand on the tocsin he'd better give up his job and quit than do what he's done to help make the town think hard of joe and what is he why he's worse than cory when that claudine fear first came here jean bantry was hanging around her himself joe knew it and he'd never tell but i will i saw a buggy riding out near beaver beach and she slapped his face for him it ought to be told i didn't know that joe knew that eugene stammered huskily it was it was a long time ago if you understood joe she said in a low voice you would know that before these men leave this house he will have their promise never to tell his eyes fell miserably then lifted again but in her clear and unbearable gaze there shone such a flame of scorn as he could not endure to look upon for the first time in his life he saw a true light upon himself and though the vision was darkling the revelation was complete heaven pity you she whispered eugene found himself alone and stumbled away his glance not lifted he passed his own home without looking up and did not see his mother beckoning frantically from a window she ran to the door and called him he did not hear her and went on toward the tocsin office with his head still bent end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the conquest of canaan by booth tarkington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one norbert waits for joe there was meat for gossip aplenty in canaan that afternoon and evening there were rumors that ran from kitchen to parlor and rumors that ran from parlor to kitchen speculations that detained housewives in talk across front gates wonderings that held cooks in converse over shadeless back fences in spite of the heat and canards that brought the main street clerks running to the shop doors to stare up and down the sidewalks out of the confusion of report the judicious were able by evenfall to extract a fair history of this day of revolution there remained no doubt that joe louden was in attendance at the deathbed of eskew arp and somehow it came to be known that colonel flitcroft squire buckaloo and peter bradbury had shaken hands with joe and declared themselves his friends there were those particularly among the relatives of the hoary trio who expressed the opinion that the colonel and his comrades were too old to be responsible and the commission ought to sit on them nevertheless some echoes of eskew's last argument to the conclave had sounded in the town and were not wholly without effect everywhere there was a nipping curiosity to learn how judge pike had taken the strange performance of his daughter and the eager were much disappointed when it was truthfully reported that he had done and said very little he had merely discharged both sam warden and sam's wife from his service 
the mild manner of the dismissal almost unnerving mr warden although he was fully prepared for birdshot and the couple had found immediate employment in the service of ariel tabor those who humanly felt the judge's behavior to be a trifle flat and unsensational were recompensed late in the afternoon when it became known that eugene bantry had resigned his position on the tocsin his reason for severing his connection was dumbfounding he had written a formal letter to the judge and repeated the gist of it to his associates in the office and acquaintances upon the street he declared that he no longer sympathized with the attitude of the tocsin toward his stepbrother and regretted that he had previously assisted in emphasizing the paper's hostility to joe particularly in the matter of the approaching murder trial this being the case he felt that his effectiveness in the service of the paper had ceased and he must in justice to the owner resign well i'm damned was the simple comment of the elder louton when his stepson sought him out of the factory and repeated this statement to him so am i i think said eugene wanely good-bye i'm going now to see mother and i'll be gone before you come home gone where just away i don't know where eugene answered from the door i couldn't live here any longer i-you've been drinking said mr louden inspired you'd better not let mamie pike see you eugene laughed desolately i don't mean to i shall write to her good-bye he said and was gone before mr louden could restore enough order out of the chaos in his mind to stop him thus mrs louden's long wait at the window was tragically rewarded and she became an unhappy actor in canaan's drama of that day other ladies attended at other windows or near their front doors throughout the afternoon the families of the three patriarchs awaiting their return as the time drew on with something akin to frenzy mrs flitcroft a lady of temper whose rheumatism confined her to a chair had her grandson wheel her out upon the porch and as the dusk fell and she finally saw her husband coming at a laggard pace leaning upon his cane his chin sunk on his breast she frankly told norbert that although she had lived with that man more than fifty-seven years she would never be able to understand him she repeated this with genuine symptoms of hysteria when she discovered that the colonel had not come straight from the tabor house but had stopped two hours at peter bradbury's to talk it over one item of his recital while sufficiently startling to his wife had a remarkable effect upon his grandson this was the information that ariel tabor's fortune no longer existed what's that cried norbert starting to his feet what are you talking about it's true said the colonel deliberately she told me so herself eskew had dropped off into a sort of doze more like a stupor perhaps and we all went into roger's old studio except louden and the doctor and while we were there talking one of pike's clerks came with a basket full of tin boxes and packages of paper and talked to miss tabor at the door and went away then old peter blundered out and asked her point blank what it was and she said it was her estate almost everything she had except the house buckaloo trying to make a joke said he'd be willing to swap his house and lot for the basket and she laughed and told him she thought he'd be sorry that all there was to speak of was a pile of distillery stock what repeated norbert incredulously yes it was the truth said the colonel solemnly i saw it myself blocks and blocks of stock in that distillery trust that went up higher in a kite last year roger had put all of jonas's good money not into that shouted norbert uncontrollably excited yes he did i tell you i saw it i tell you he didn't he owned granger gas worth more today than it ever was pike was roger's attorney in fact and bought it for him before the old man died the check went through my hands you don't think i'd forget as big a check as that do you even if it was more than a year ago or how it was signed and who made out to it was martin pike that got caught with distillery stock 
You speculated once too often. No, you're wrong, persisted the Colonel. I tell you, I saw it myself. Then you're blind, returned his grandson disrespectfully. You're blind, or else... Or else... He paused, open-mouthed, a look of wonder struggling its way to expression upon him, gradually conquering every knobby outpost of his countenance. He struck his fat hands together. "'Where's Joe Loudon?' he asked sharply. "'I want to see him. Did you leave him at Miss Tabor's? He's going to sit up with Eskew. What do you want of him?' "'I should say you better ask that,' Mrs. Flitcroft began shrilly. It's enough, I guess, for one of this family to go running after him and shaking hands with him, and heaven knows what not. Norbert Flitcroft, but Norbert jumped from the porch, ruthlessly crossed his grandmother's geranium bed, and making off at as sharp a pace as his architecture permitted, within ten minutes opened Ariel's gate. Sam Warden came forward to meet him. Don't ring, please, sir, said Sam. They sought me out here to tell inquiring friends that poor Miss Arp mighty low. I want to see Mr. Loudon, returned Norbert. I want to see him immediately. I don't reckon ye can come out yet, Sam said in a low tone. But I can go in and ask him. He stepped softly within, leaving Norbert waiting, and went to the door of the sick room. The door was open, the room brightly lit, as Eskew had commanded when, a little earlier, he awoke. Joe and Ariel were alone with him, leaning toward him with such white anxiety that the colored man needed no warning to make him remain silent in the hallway. The veteran was speaking, and his voice was very weak, seeming to come from a great distance. It's mighty funny, but I feel like I used to when I was a little boy. I reckon I'm kind of scared, after all. Harry Tabor, are you here? Yes, Mr. Arp. I thought so, but I don't see very well lately. I wanted to know, to know. Yes, to know. She knelt close beside him. It's kind of foolish, he whispered. I just wanted to know if you were still here. It don't seem so lonesome now that I know. She put her arm lightly about him, and he smiled and was silent for a time. Then he struggled to rise upon his elbow, and they lifted him a little. It's hard to breathe, gasped the old man. I'm pretty near the big road. Joe Loudon? Yes. You'd have been willing, willing to change places with me just now. When Harry... Joe laid his hand on his and eskew smiled again i thought so and joe yes you always always had the the best of that joke between us do you do you suppose they charge admission up there his eyes were lifted do you suppose you've got to to show your good deeds to get in the answering whisper was almost as faint as the old man's no panted eskew nobody knows but i hope i do hope they'll have some free seats it's a mighty poor show we'll all have if they don't he sighed peacefully his head grew heavier on joe's arm and the young man set his hand gently upon the unseeing eyes. Ariel did not rise from where she knelt, but looked up at him when, a little later, he lifted his hand. Yes, said Joe, you can cry now. End of chapter 21